Hi, I'm Larry Dapsis. I'm the entomologist with Cape Cod Cooperative Extension. And in this segment, we're going to be talking about a variety of tick-borne diseases. Now, for Lone Star Tick, we cover off on those particular diseases in another segment. So let's start out here with the American Dog Tick. Here's an adult female on the left and an adult male on the right, nymph in the middle. And I consider this more of an annoyance than a public health threat. Even though they can vector the pathogens that cause Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever and Tularemia, but in Massachusetts, those two diseases are quite rare. Rocky Mounted is much more prevalent in areas like the Carolinas and out west of Oklahoma. So let's look at the deer tick or the more proper and accurate name for this tick is really the black-legged tick. And there's a number of different things associated with it, but the headliner is Lyme disease. Now, Lyme is not something that started out in Lyme, Connecticut in 40 years ago and radiated outward. That's where the puzzle was solved. They associated with uh, the bacteria, with the disease, and the deer tick. Now, if you look at Lyme, it is distributed widely. It is endemic in 80 different countries around the world. It's been on this planet for perhaps 50,000 years. So this is a very widely distributed. It's not a new disease. It's a re-emerging disease. So if we look at what's been going on recently in the United States, sure, we see the number of cases has been increasing dramatically over the years. And if you look at this map carefully, there are dots sprinkled all over the United States so that Lyme disease has been found in 49 out of 50 states and because ticks haven't learned how to swim, it hasn't found its way to Hawaii. Um, and Lyme is endemic in basically 14 different states. So basically, you know, the mid-Atlantic states to the northeast and the upper central Midwest, western Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. And the Centers for Disease Control, they compile statistics. And for a number of years, they were reporting 30,000 cases of Lyme disease each year. And they got a lot of pushback on that number to a point where in 2016, they adjusted that number upwards by tenfold to 300,000 cases per year. So it's now being recognized as a public health crisis. If we look at the New England area, yeah, all six New England states occupy the top six positions in the country. So if there was any question at all whether we're living at ground zero, this takes it off the table completely. If we look at this across the Commonwealth, um, Nantucket County and Dukes County, Martha's Vineyard, they have more cases of Lyme disease than any other place in the visible universe. Now, historically, Barnstable County was number three. And back in 2014, Plymouth County passed Barnstable County by a, a significant margin. But there is an increase, uh, a trend across the state, uh, so that you know other areas where it's actually quite low for the time being, those areas are going up quite steadily right now. So the risk of infection is year round, okay? And we'll look at some data in a second. But the greatest risk isn't where you might think it is based on the data. It's not from these adult stage deer ticks. They come out in the fall and they're with us through the winter and to the spring. And in our surveillance research, we find that on average 50% of them are packing that bug that causes Lyme disease. But that's a larger stage of the tick and you're more likely to detect that one. The biggest risk is from these nymph stage ticks. These come out on Cape Cod late May, and they'll be with us until early August. And in our surveillance work, we find that about 25% of them are infected with the Lyme bug. But that's a much smaller stage, and is more likely to elude a tick check, okay? So that adult stage tick, it's about the size of a sesame seed. That nymph stage tick is the size of a poppy seed. So something the size of a poppy seed with eight legs, a really bad attitude that can plant you on your behind for a long time. And we see this reflected in the case data. This shows Lyme disease by, by month. And so we see cases in January, February, March, you know, all the way to December. And that nymph stage tick that's out during the summer months, that stage is responsible for 85% of all tick-borne diseases. So we need to be vigilant year round, but we really have to be on our game during the summer months. And not everybody's impacted equally. This shows Lyme disease by age group. So if you look at the far left here, kids age five to nine 
have the highest incidence rate of Lyme in Massachusetts. So my message to parents is that everything we've been doing up to this point to protect our kids is not working well enough, all right? So then you see the incidence rate goes down for people in their 20s and 30s and early you know, 40s. And so people are starting careers, starting families, not as much outdoor activity time. And then as you get older, sure, a couple things are going on. There's more leisure time, uh, things like gardening, so ticks and gardening go hand in hand. Uh, and then we see this other peak, you know, people age, you know, late 50s and 60 and above. So we see this bimodal distribution of case data. And with the data we now get from the Laboratory of Medical Zoology at UMass Amherst, those are the two groups that are getting most of the tick bites. All right. 25 years ago, we would have put the period on the page here with Lyme disease and went on to some other things about, you know, how do we protect ourselves and things like that. But this landscape has been shifting steadily over the years, and it's even changed in the last couple of years. There's a second disease that we worry about, uh, babesiosis. And this is a parasite that invades your red blood cells. So it's kind of like getting malaria. And as with malaria, you get symptoms of fever and chills because as that parasite is reproducing, your red blood cells are blowing up like little water balloons. So you generally, severe anemia, your plate counts will drop like a rock off a cliff. The other thing we know is that you can get babesiosis from a blood transfusion. So there's a lot of work ongoing to try and figure out a way to screen the quality of the blood supply. And where we find this, yeah, southeastern Massachusetts, uh, over 50% of the cases in the state are found here, but we see this at some level in every single county across the state. This is probably what the distribution of Lyme disease looked like in Massachusetts, say 25 or 30 years ago. It was Cape and Islands and then spread across the state. And with these emerging diseases like babesiosis, we're seeing a similar trend. Now, third disease, anaplasmosis. And this is a parasite that invades one type of your white blood cells, your granulocytes. And if you look at the symptoms, fever, nausea, headache, muscle pain, abdominal pain, confusion, brain fog, a lot of those look like the symptoms of Lyme disease. So this can make it very tricky for the attending physician to figure out, you know, is it a tick-borne disease? Is it Lyme disease? Is it not? Could it be anaplasmosis? And we certainly have our hotspots on the Cape and the Islands, but this is more broadly distributed. So Boston Metro West, the North Shore, and for whatever reason, uh, Southern Berkshire County is overrun with this thing at this point in time. And these diseases are steadily on the increase, all right? This is not going away. And if you look at the age distribution of these two diseases, very, very different from Lyme disease. These two diseases are uncommon in younger people. Doesn't mean it doesn't occur, but not that often. If you look at 95% of the cases are for people 60 and older. All right, and now we're up to a fourth one that we found out about uh, back in 2014, uh, Borrelia miyamotoi. So this uh, bacteria has been known about for a number of years. It's actually Borrelia, and so it's related to the Lyme disease bacteria, but it's a distant relative. And the, the linkage to human disease was established only very recently uh, in Russia. And once they published their findings, they started diagnosing cases in the United States, uh, where they're now calling it relapsing fever. And we have had cases diagnosed here on Cape Cod and treated. And when we look at the tick population, we see this pathogen in about 3% of the ticks on the Cape. So it's out there at a very low level, but it's probably gonna follow the pattern of these other emerging diseases. Now, the fifth one that we're aware of now, a few years ago, Department of Public Health made, uh, made us aware that we've had 14 cases of Powassan virus in the state. And the typical clinical presentation is encephalitis, so swelling of the brain. And this will land you in the hospital in a heartbeat. And unfortunately, you can't treat this. You can only provide supportive care. And there were three fatalities. So on average, it's fatal in about 10% of the cases. 
So we were interested in distribution of Powassan in Cape Ticks because it's, it's new, it's on the radar. So we decided to partner up with the Laboratory of Medical Zoology at UMass Amherst. That's Dr. Steve Rich, the lab director on the far right, um, the team in the middle, uh, awesome team, and on the left, uh, Dr. Zhuang Zhu, uh, research associate, basically master Yoda of this analytical procedure they use. So we decided to do surveillance for this thing. We were curious, you know, can we find it? We thought we were looking for a needle in a haystack. And we established six sampling sites. And we were kind of surprised at our data uh, once we looked at it. Uh, we found Powassan-infected ticks at four out of the six sites, ranging from Falmouth all the way out here to Truro. So quite a broad range. And we found it at infection rates as high as 10% in the tick populations. So this suggests a couple different things to us. One is the distribution, Falmouth all the way to Truro. Well, we know that this virus is associated with animals that have relatively low territorial ranges, things like woodchucks and, and some other critters. And when we investigated the literature to kind of see what else other people found, uh, we found out that this has probably been on Cape Cod for 10 or 15,000 years. It's just flown under the medical radar screen. And the infection rates as high as 10%. Uh, it suggests that we now have to look at this like West Nile virus. There's probably a lot of people that can be exposed to this virus and be completely asymptomatic, that they don't get sick at all. So, um, so we're on the watch for this thing and, uh, and we'll continue to do surveillance. So this is my contact information. I'm always open for business. I look forward to your phone calls or, or exchanging emails. And we would like to thank Cape Cod Healthcare for their financial support for this program.